Hi everyone, my name's Gareth and I'll be hosting this episode of AT Extra. Today we've got a great professional synoptic revision session for you from Peak Accountancy Training, which is going to cover the accounting systems and controls part of the assessment. If you haven't watched AT Extra before, this series is designed to motivate and support you with your studies, as well as provide you with information on how being a member of AT can really help shape your career. Make sure you stay tuned after the revision session because I'll be back to talk to you a little bit about how you can become your own boss with AAT. Remember, if you can't watch the episode right now, don't worry, you can watch the video at any time after the stream. All you have to do is go to facebook.com forward slash your AAT forward slash videos. Before we join Peak Accountancy Training, I want to share with you a few updates from AAT. If you need to sit either your foundation or advanced synoptic assessment, you can sit them this week because we're in a window now which ends on Sunday the 8th. Results for this window will be available on the 16th of April. The next professional synoptic assessment window is between the 9th and 15th of March. Results will be available on the 23rd of April. Please remember, Results for synoptic assessments will be available throughout their respective release days. Finally, I'd like to urge you to get involved with your local AAT branch network. AAT branch networks are a great place to improve your accountancy knowledge, soft skills, and network with other like-minded accounting professionals. AAT branches run free events up and down the country for AAT students and members. We have all sorts of events such as focusing on exam technique to helping you prepare for final exams, focusing on handling your nerves and performing well under pressure, as well as events focused on gaining work experience, employment and many transferable skills like communication, time management and organisation. Some events coming up in March are a student network meetup at the Edinburgh branch on the 10th of March, time management with the Cheshire and Staffordshire branch on the 10th as well, improving your presentation skills with the Merseyside branch on the 14th of March, and Excel hints and tips with the Northampton branch on the 25th of March. You can find out more and reach out to your local branch at aat.org.uk forward slash branches. And that's all for now. I'll be back after peak accountancy training session to talk to you a little bit about how you can become your own boss with AAT. Good afternoon, my name's Clive Pauling and I'm one of the owners of Peak Accountancy Training based up in the Northwest. Uh, we have classrooms in Liverpool and Chester and also provide online courses for the AAT qualification. Uh, so this afternoon, this session is all about I guess the overall premise of the level four synoptic exam, uh, but then specifically focusing in on the accounting systems and controls part of the syllabus and the questions you're likely to encounter in questions three and in questions six. So let's have a look at the mindset that you should be in for your synoptic exam. What's it setting out to do? What are the challenges? Well, my suggestion is that you start to think like a manager. When a manager comes into work each day, myself, for example, I have absolutely no idea what is going to land in my intray. My work is not necessarily predictable. So why should your synoptic exam be predictable? Your synoptic exam should be testing the expertise and the knowledge that you've attained throughout your AAT journey in the same way that I would use my expertise and knowledge to address the challenges that a day's work throws up. And that's how you should view your synoptic exam. You need to be able to draw on your studies at levels two, three, and four to solve business problems. And don't forget, of course, you can always draw on any work experience as well. This is practical stuff. The AAT qualification is practical stuff. It's what accountants do in the office every day, week in, week out. 
but like a manager, scrutinize everything. And don't be afraid to give your opinion. This is the final step to you becoming a qualified accounting technician and a member of a professional body. It's time to show the examiner what you've got. So what about accounting systems and controls? All of us are trained in processes and systems. From day one of a new job, you're probably given a set of instructions to follow to perform a particular job. Have you ever sat in your office wondering why you're doing something? What's the point of some of the tasks? Why on earth do I have to do that? Why do I have to carry out all of these steps? Have you ever sat there and thought, this process is so inefficient, it's so prone to error. I'm sure that we could make some improvements. I'm sure you have. But, uh, do you know, it's not until you get involved in creating a process from scratch that you realize just how many things you have to remember. At level two, you learn about sole traders, for example. Now, a sole trader is responsible for their own business. Their livelihood depends on how good they are. They get all the profit, but they have all the risks. If it goes wrong, they've got nobody but themselves to blame. But as the business grows, so they're not going to be able to do everything themselves. They're going to have to take on staff. Their problem is how to engage their staff and give their staff the same mindset that they've got to carry out the job to the same level of standard, the same quality. Now that, as the business grows further, is no easy matter. Remember our Synoptic has a backdrop of a limited company or a PLC, potentially hundreds of staff. What motivates each member of staff? Have they got the same level of commitment, the same values, the same ethics as the original business owner? Maybe not. Maybe there are some people there who are just there to pick up their monthly paycheck. Maybe they're not really bothered about what the business does and the service it provides. We need processes, systems, controls to make sure all of those staff know what they're doing, do it as accurately as possible, do it efficiently, do it to the right level of quality and tick all those compliance boxes. This is the point of accounting systems and controls. So your exam will get you analyzing a system or process. You'll be given a scenario on the day of a typical operating process. It could be a sales ledger, a purchase ledger, a cash book process, a payroll, an inventory system. Who knows? You'll be described to you the characters that are involved in the process and the mechanics of what they do. Your job is to scrutinize that process and say what you think of it. Task three typically will ask you for weaknesses of that system. But how can you break down weaknesses? I'll come to that in a moment. But in task six as well, you might be asked again for weaknesses, but perhaps this time with recommendations for improvements. But you also might come across something called a SWOT analysis. What's a SWOT analysis? It's just a very simple tool to help you to evaluate something. It can be done at any level of business. The board of directors can do a SWOT analysis to look at the business as a whole. Departmental managers can do a SWOT analysis to look at their departments. You can use a SWOT analysis to analyze a particular process. You can even do one on yourself. SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strengths and weaknesses are things within the business, things that the business has control over. So strengths, what's the business good at? What's the department good at? 
what, a, what is good about the process itself. Those strengths will help the business to be better, the process to be better, give opportunities that the business can grasp. Weaknesses, clearly, was not so good. Basically, what could go wrong? Opportunities and threats, things outside of the business, outside of the control of the business, opportunities out in the environment that as long as we've got some strengths, we've got the ability to exploit for future profit. Threats, what's out in the environment that threatens the chances of us achieving our objectives, threatens our potential success. Things for a business or a manager to consider. Increase our strengths, reduce our weaknesses, seize those opportunities and get rid of the threats. Now, if you're asked to do a SWOT analysis in your exam, make it relevant to the scenario. Don't just remember a page of a textbook where you've seen a SWOT analysis demonstrated and just think, it's bound to be in there somewhere. I'll put all these points down. The examiner will give me some marks. Make it relevant to the scenario. Say what the strength is. But more importantly, why have you put it down? Exactly how does the strength work for the business? How does it help the business? What are the implications of that weakness or that threat? That's how to do a SWOT analysis. But back to those weaknesses, task three. Typically, if you look at the samples, can you find five weaknesses in this process and explain their impacts? You need some sort of structure to help. So how about this? You can't critique anything unless you know what it's designed to achieve. So what is our process for? What are the objectives? Then you can start to think, does this process, does this system allow us to achieve those objectives? So for weaknesses, what could go wrong? Basically, this is risk management. What are the risks? You identify the risks, you assess the risks. All of us, I'm sure, have come across a risk assessment. You might have been asked by your managers to do a risk assessment of your workstation. All those trailing cables and coffee cups left around. Risk assessment at the end of the day. What is the chance that this risk event that we're worried about will happen? And if it does happen, what impact is it going to have on the business? Because the answer to those two questions allow us to think about how we're going to manage that risk. We could just avoid it. For example, just don't do it. It's just too risky. Or we could transfer the risk. After all, isn't that what insurance is? All of us run a risk when we jump in a car that, heaven forbid, there's some sort of accident. What do we do? We pay a premium to insure against it. Somebody else picks up the risk. So we can avoid it. We can transfer it. We could absorb it. Don't do anything about it. It might be that we think, well, the chance of this happening is quite slim, to be honest. And if it did happen, well, it might be immaterial. That could be a scenario. So what's the point in spending money trying to reduce it? Cost benefit crops up in accounting systems and controls. Or finally, we could manage the risk. Do something about it. Put a control in place. But the control is going to cost us money. Some of you may have come across a mnemonic, spam soap. Why is it useful? Because it gives us a whole load of headings with which to consider control. So when you're scrutinizing that exam question that's depicting a process, look out and see whether some of these things are present or not. So what's the S? Supervision. Are the staff supervised? Should they be supervised? Depends whether they can be trusted and whether they've got the experience or the qualification to do the job. 
So if the scenario is talking about junior staff with little experience, doing work that isn't checked, doing work unsupervised, there's some risks there, surely. Things could go wrong. P, personnel. How do we control our personnel? Could be right at the start. Have we got any controls over who we recruit in the first place? Have we got people with the right quality? Have we got people with the right ethical views that will fit the business requirements? Once they're in, what about the training? Are they trained? Have they received induction? Do they know the values of the business? Do they understand what the business is trying to achieve? Do they understand how their work fits in with everybody else? Are they set targets? Are they given appraisals? Is there a disciplinary process in place? The A, authority. Who has the authority to make decisions? Does anybody have the authority to make decisions? Who has the authority to sign off on expenses? Is it at the appropriate level? With very large amounts of money, surely you would expect two senior managers to sign off. If not, is there a chance that expenditure is unauthorized, unnecessary? M, management. What does that mean? Aren't managers there to put some structure into place, to make sure that people just don't muddle along and do their own thing? Design of the processes and the systems. Breaking jobs down into smaller tasks, allocating responsibility for those tasks to different people. S, segregation of duties. Why do we have segregation of duties? Well, you might jump up and down immediately and be shouting fraud. It stops fraud from happening. Actually, it doesn't stop fraud from happening. It just reduces the risk of fraud. We can never eliminate anything. There's always a small risk left over. But yeah, sure, segregation of duties. If there's more than one person involved in the process, then somebody else is always watching. It reduces the chance of somebody committing a fraud. But it could be very easy with this part of our synoptic exam to give the answer fraud against every single question. Sure, there's a risk that it happens, but isn't there a greater risk that errors could be made? Errors lead to bad decisions. Errors lead to reports being inaccurate. Errors lead to customer dissatisfaction and poor quality. There's a far greater chance of errors being made. We're human after all. If there's segregation of duties, then somebody else is checking somebody else's work. In classes, sometimes people look round at this point when I'm talking about the importance of segregation of duties and say, well, how does that work? I work for a small business. There's only me in accounts. How am I supposed to do achieve segregation of duties? It's a good question. It's not going to happen to you in your exam because the exam is based on a limited company or a PLC, a large organization where you can have segregation of duties. So how do you get around that in a small business? It's all about trust. But a small business, the manager of that business is much closer to what's happening. They're very hands on. They're going to spot problems very, very quickly. And therefore, you're not going to survive very long in that business. Maybe if you don't share the same work ethic as the boss. And if you make errors all the time or even try to commit a fraud, the manager will spot it very quickly. It's a different world. Back to spam soap. O, organization, hierarchy, if you like. Breaking the work down, giving responsibility to different areas of the business. The A and the P, accounting controls. We should all understand about those, whether it's Control account reconciliations, bank reconciliations, variance analysis, the list goes on. And then finally, how about physical controls? What about access to hardware, access to software? After all, data and information is an incredibly valuable asset. We don't want anybody being able to get into our systems, but I'm sure many of you go into work each day and need a swipe card to gain access to the building. 
If you work in a warehouse, I'm sure there's security cameras to make sure that people don't pilfer uh, things from the warehouse. Physical security. So spam soap, what a useful mnemonic. A whole list of different controls that you could expect to come across in a business. Have a look in the exam scenario. Are those things there? Are they not? So we design our controls. We design our process to achieve a particular objective or a set of objectives. We then monitor and review. Are errors still being made? Is fraud being committed? Is quality being impaired? Are customers jumping up and down because they're not very happy? Something's surely wrong with the process. Things need to be changed. So let's consider task three. Typical marking scheme. What's the weakness? One mark. But explain why you've put it down. Why have you picked it out? What's the implication to the business of that weakness? Depth of explanation is everything. Show you understand the reasons. Two marks. And be inventive. The answer isn't always fraud. The answer isn't always lack of segregation of duties. So what could the answers be? Wowza, look at all those. Risks or weaknesses in systems and processes. They could lead, yes, to fraud, but they could lead to a lack of efficiency. Going to cost the business more money, going to impact on the bottom line, profit. They could lead to reporting issues. And after all, we've got to produce financial statements which show a true and fair view because they're going to be read by third parties who are going to base investment decisions on them or whether to contract with us or not. If the figures are wrong, the wrong decisions are made. Reporting also management information that managers need to make decisions. If the information's wrong because of data input errors, for example, then the business isn't going to succeed. There's lots of legislation that we need to comply with. Weaknesses in systems could mean we don't tick that compliance box. The result is fines, damaged reputation. Customer service and quality. Weaknesses in our systems could impair quality, could make our customer service poor. What's going to happen then? Customers aren't going to come back to us. Not only that, customers aren't going to recommend us to their friends. Revenues affected, profits affected. What else have we got? Ethics. Do weaknesses in systems install the wrong ethics in our staff. What are the values of our business after all? There's many more uh, reasons potentially, many more implications of those weaknesses than just, oh, it will lead to fraud. Sure, it's important, but as I say, the risks of other things, in reality, I think, are probably far greater. So, if task three is more about weaknesses, what of task six? You could get the same again, but with a twist. You've identified the weakness in your system. What are you going to do now? You're going to decide whether it's worth spending money to beef up those controls. So you're going to do your cost-benefit analysis. You could have questions testing that you understand what this is. As I said before, all controls have costs. You've got to work out whether there's enough of a benefit behind the control system to make the cost justifiable. If you had a scenario that was littered with different costs, which costs are you going to bring in to your cost-benefit calculation? You're going to bring in the relevant ones. What's a relevant cost? One that is specifically incurred because of the change you're making or the decision that you're making. That's a relevant cost. 
something that's going to arise in the future, something that is incremental to the cost that you're currently incurring. That's all there is to it. Then, if you had to talk about cost-benefit analysis, there's tangible and intangible costs and benefits. Tangible, the things you can easily see, the things that you can easily put a financial figure against, but there are other intangible elements. You know, if you like, that there's an impact, but you can't necessarily quantify it. You can't necessarily hand on heart say, that is a direct consequence of the change that we're anticipating to make. For example, an, an improvement in a process could lead to greater customer satisfaction, which could be the reason that your sales have increased. Is it the only reason, though? But it's still a benefit that you would be considering. So we found our weakness. We've decided we need to recommend a change to our process. We've presented it to our manager. We've backed it up with a cost-benefit analysis because the first thing the manager is going to ask is, well, that's going to cost me money, and I'm not going to do that. So you've proved to your manager that the cost is justifiable. What next? We need to roll the thing out. We need to implement it. What does that mean? Well, there's various different ways that we can roll out a new process. But we also need to consider the impact that the implementation will have on the staff that are going to need to work with the new system or the new process. We need to provide the right level of training. And then once the thing's in place, we need to monitor and review. So, there's the basic premise for the accounting systems uh, and controls part of the exam. You work with these processes every day. It's not rocket science. I'm sure, as I mentioned at the beginning, you can sit down and you can critique the processes that you work with. All you're being asked to do on the day of the exam is do the same thing, sure, with a bit of an alien scenario, as in you've only just read it. But that is all you're required to do. But to show that you understand the implications. Say something interesting to the examiner and back it up. That is what it's all about. So, I hope you found this presentation useful. I hope it's given you some food for thought. But think like a manager. You are the manager of the future, after all. It's in your hands. Nobody else is going to tell you what to do. So all that remains for me to say is good luck with your up-and-coming synoptic exam from all of us at Peak Accountancy Training. And now I'm going to hand you over to AAT, who are going to talk to you about becoming your own boss. Thanks, Clive, and thank you, Peak Accountancy Training, for that brilliant session. From everybody here at AAT2, good luck in your assessments next week. We really hope you do well. Now, as Clive previously mentioned, I want to tell you a little bit about being your own boss. In the next few minutes, I will cover the why you should consider applying for an AAT license and how you can take your first step towards it. But first, I have a quick video I want to show you where AAT members talk about why they want to become their own boss and where they are on their journeys. I've started my AAT level four just over a year and a half ago. I want to be my own boss. When I started my AAT journey, I said to myself that I, I'm going to get there one day. I applied to be a full member, so I'm now MAAT. My license has been approved recently. I finished level four and went straight into teaching AAT. And I'm now going back to doing the accounting, which is what I started out doing. Still teaching, obviously. AAT 
earning potential is probably double what I would make in practice. Really excited about the opportunity of managing something in its entirety. It's very difficult to find a job for the hours that I want to do. That would be a huge bonus if I could pick and choose the days that I wanted to work. Having a great work-life balance, really enjoying the work part of it as well as the life part of it. It's important to have a licence because it gives your clients the confidence that you are governed. AAT as an organisation are incredibly supportive. Taking the first step is very, very important. Everyone tells me that I can do it. They encourage me and push me past the limitations that I think I have. There's a lot of possibilities and you can kind of decide what you want to do with it. AAT was the best way to go and sort of the most friendly way to go, if that makes sense as well. <laughs> I think I will be quite a... I think I will be a hands-on boss. I think I'd be a great boss. <laughs> Practical. I'm, I'm very pragmatic. Pretty epic. <laughs> I'm going to be like the best boss. <laughs>Now you've heard from some AAT members, let's take a look at some of the things they said in a little more detail. As a few of our members talked about in the video, the key benefit for most people who run their own practice with AAT is the flexibility. You're the boss, so you call the shots on when and how you work. So if you need to fit your business around childcare or start it as a sideline around your full-time job, you'll have the flexibility to do that. So long as you're keeping your clients happy, it's really down to you. Another big draw of being your own boss is the earning potential. Because you have the freedom to manage your practice in a way that works for you, you have more control over what you ultimately earn. The decisions about what to charge, what software to use, how to advertise and other things that can impact your overall income are all yours to make, which a lot of people find really exciting and empowering. However, it's worth pointing out that it's pretty challenging too. If you're going out on your own, it can be a bit daunting as you won't have a whole team of people to turn to for help. That's why it's really important to build your own network and to use the AAT support and resources on offer to help you get off to the best possible start. For example, you can attend AAT events and share ideas with other AAT licensed members who run their own practices. Once you've received your license, you can also use the AAT license accountant or bookkeeper logo on your marketing, which will demonstrate your credibility to potential clients. You'll also have access to other resources to help you advertise your business and make sure you're compliant with AAT policies and money laundering regulations. There's a lot to think about, but we'll be here to help guide and support you wherever we can. So where do you go from here? If running your own business sounds like it could be for you, the first thing to do is to download our Be Your Own Boss Guide, which you can access through the link in the comment section. Just answer a few quick questions and then you'll be able to access the guide. You can also choose to opt in to our Be Your Own Boss emails that we'll be sending next week. There's also useful information and stories from our members at aat.org.uk forward slash be your own boss. Or you can start your application at aat.org.uk forward slash license.